Thanks again for being with us. We really, although we are, can't be physically next to each other, we know that we can be close at heart, spiritually connected to one another, and so we are. And perhaps even more so, not just through the, the technology, which God bless it has kept us close to the Eucharist and to the sacrifice of the Mass and to our celebrations, but also because we understand in our own hearts a little bit of what it must mean to lose someone because we have experienced that particular knowledge of loss in our own hearts and still carry some of those burdens within our hearts as the years have gone by. Time, the tincture of time, does help us to make peace with loss, but we never forget those whom God gave to us in that wonderful communion of holy love, love for one another. 400,000 souls, 400,000 souls. Do you realize 400,000, that, that's, there's only 109,000, I think, in Colombia. 109,000 people living in Colombia. So it's, it's as if one day you got up and the passage of the year, not having been in Colombia, and you decided to stop in and send, we said, where is it? And said, it's all gone. Everyone who was here is gone. You'd say, well, how could that have happened? And you say, what about Ellicott City? Ellicott City has 73,000 people in it. Say, they're all gone. All gone. What about Towson? All gone. And so the sheer number of this is something that is awfully hard to wrap our heads around. And so even though one candle shows a thousand lives honored before our altar today, we can only perhaps really perceive this one life at a time, which is how other people perceived it. That the one person that was so dear to them, you know, has now left this life, this world. And two million in the world itself, over 400,000 in our country alone. And our country only is only just beginning, I think, to understand the affliction that this is. And so we come with our hearts breaking. We come with a sense of, of a staggering number to wrap our heads around. And one of the ways that I think we can strengthen one another in this is to say that there are certain things in life that, that people do understand I mean, there's many things we'll never understand. There's some things that we'll never know. And there's probably things that people knew in ancient days that we have, that have been lost in the, the tide of antiquity and the passage of time, which we have not rediscovered. But because love is invincible and love is not destroyed merely by death or the passing of time, you know, we still remember. And so even though someone is not present with us right now, even though they've gone to God, it is not as if we no longer have any connection with those whom we have loved. In fact, there's that wonderful poem, How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height. My soul can can find when feeling out of sight for the ends of being an ideal grace. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight. Namely, like from morning to evening, our love is available for one another, to one another. And it, it ends with, I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. In which case we recall that love is expressed itself in tears of sorrow and tears of joy, you know, in laughter. We have that wonderful quote from Ecclesiastes, which says, there is a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to embrace, a time to be far from embraces, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to laugh. And so these, this is all part of what it means to be a, a human 
and to be alive and to be loved and to love. I, once, I remember a, a priest friend of mine who, who told me one time how uh, remarkable he thought it was that in his lifetime he went from where you might have you, movie theaters were huge places and they would hold thousands of people and they would have a very, very wide, broad screen and they would have Panavision and uh, um, you could have it in 3D and, and then sometimes you would have, besides the one show, there'd be a double feature and you might see one or two shows and in fact back then it would be that if you you just came up to the movie theater because the person at the ticket counter was always selling tickets all day and when you got in, you began to pick up the storyline. And then if, if it was just one show, you waited to watch it again until you said, okay, here's the part where we came in. Remember that? And if it was a double feature, two shows. Well, this priest remarked how remarkable it was. You could go into a movie theater and there'd be five, 10, 12, 20, more than 25 cinemas in one place and they all had their own story. And he said, as you picked out the one that you wanted to find out about, that you wanted to listen to, that you wanted to be engaged with, you went past all these other doors and different stories that we were not going to hear or see, and perhaps never see, were going on with other people going in. And he said, the individual doors to the stories that were told on the cinema reminded him of all the places where people lived, and behind each door, there was a story. Behind each door, there was souls that have been kissed by God's love, blessed by his faith, hopefully, and, and brought together with one another, always imperfectly, but sometimes wonderfully. And I think because of that, with the God of the heights and God of the depths, a God for our rising and our dying, God for our weeping and our laughing, our mourning and our dancing. You know, that these aren't just something that exists outside of who you and I are in our hearts, in our minds, in our soul, in our psyche. You know, what a wonderful thing it is to, to weep with someone, tears of joy or sadness, because then you know your hearts are close together. And lots of times we're just really passing, just passing through. All these other hearts, all these other souls that we never connect with, the community that we strive to build, and that's one reason why we pray for our country, is we don't seek to be a nation just of people living in their separate silos, behind their own doors, closed off to any other contact. We try to live as a community of people that care for one another and are enriched by each other's lives and each other's stories. And sometimes it's in the knowledge of how someone lives their life, even if that life now is ended, that it is still life changing for others who come into the orbit of that story, who hear how somebody lived and how somebody loved and how somebody died. And of course, that's what we do at this altar. Jesus Christ. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. It is the story of his life that lifts us up. And that shows us that life is not only a gift here and now in the treasured love that we have for each other, but it is also something that is eternal. And I don't think we'll ever really be able to understand that until we find ourselves on the other side of life in the kingdom of heaven. I've always liked the story, in fact, I like it not just because it's our primary story, but because it's so human. It's the Easter story, where Mary of Magdala goes to the tomb to finish the, uh, 
process, the ritual of anointing Jesus' body because they had to hurriedly get him down the cross, his body down from the cross and into the tomb and closed before sundown. And at sunrise, before sunrise, she goes to the tomb to finish the rites of burial and finds the stone has been rolled away. She looks in, some gospel accounts have an angel speaking to her. One says, you know, why dost thou look for Christ here among the dead? He is not dead, he is risen. But there's another one where Jesus himself comes to see her and she doesn't recognize him, perhaps because of her grief, perhaps because he's transfigured body in the resurrection. And she thinks he's the gardener. She says, sir, if you have taken him, tell me where, where you have taken him. And in that moment of her confusion and her anguish, Jesus says something to her, and what he says is her name. He says, Mary, and with that, her eyes are opened. She probably just dropped the container of oil and ointment that she had. And the scriptures say that she threw herself at his feet and embraced him. And remember that those words of scripture, you know, were, you know, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. You know, but, and in Latin, it was a very simple phrase, like, nolo tangere, you know, do not touch me. But I suspect that when Mary heard her voice and, her, and heard her name spoken by Jesus' voice, and suddenly that separation, you know, existed no longer, and the sadness of death existed no longer. You know, that had to be such a wonderful embrace that I suspect, and some people have said who have studied the language, they said it has an urgency to it, which almost indicates something like Jesus saying, please, you need to let me go, or are you trying to kill me again? So tightly was she clinging and embracing Christ. This is what will happen because of your faith and my faith, our faith in Jesus, a soul who came, was born, who lived, who died, who rose, and who sits at the right hand of the Father. Something that we believe for all of these souls because they are in the hands of God and no torment shall touch them. They seemed in view of the faithless to be dead and their passing away was thought an affliction. Well, of course, what it is. And they're going forth from us utter destruction, but they are at peace. Having suffered a little, they shall be greatly blessed because God tried them and found them to be worthy of himself. You and I cannot fathom the passing one by one, I think, because we do not see their faces. We, do not, we cannot be close to them, and even family members have not been able to draw near in grief and sorrow, you know, before their loved ones who have passed, and then just simply be with each other and to embrace, you know, to collapse on perhaps, to lean against, to hold someone's hand, to cry on their shoulder, to simply be patted on the back in a, a gentle hug that says, we're with you. And so that makes this all the more painful because we're not able to be together. But Ecclesiastes says a time to embrace, a time to be far from embraces until every tear is, is wiped away. We don't know the names of these 400,000. Um, at different times when we do our, our celebration of people's lives in the All Souls Day, we call out their names as we light a candle and then people take the candle home with them. For this, we have to say that these are people known to God. Some to us, some of our parishioners are part of this number. But it also reminds us of something else, too, is we are not separated from them, not only in our love for them, but also in the knowledge that as we are humans, too, so shall we also one day pass from this life to God. And that means that as we strive to discover as a nation on the eve of a new administration's inauguration, we strive to, to find again 
and awareness of the dignity, the importance, the humanity of each other. And because so many people have died, and because we know we are also beings unto death, there is that poem by John Donne, For Whom the Bell Tolls. It says, no man or woman is an island entire of itself. Each is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thine own or of thine friends were. Each man and woman's death diminishes me for I am involved in mankind. Therefore, send not to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. And so in each one of these souls, represented by this light, as if all, in the passage of a year, all those who lived in Ellicott City, all those who lived in Taos, and all those who lived in Columbia, and other places with the commensurate populations until we hit over 400,000, only then can we probably really understand the measure of what has been lost in this COVID. But we can be awakened by it to try to heal the gaps in our health care and in our country. And also to be more and more aware of how integrated and connected we are with one another. St. Paul says, everything that lives, lives neither alone nor for itself. Isn't it beautiful? Everything that lives, lives neither alone nor for itself. In another place, he says, while we live, we live for the Lord, and when we die, we die as his servants. Eternal rest grant unto these, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. May they rest in peace. Amen. May their soul and the souls of all the faithful departed, the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen.